So the title of today's message is Disciples Save Nations. Disciples Save Nations. Matthew 5, 13 through 16 says this, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how then shall it be seasoned? We are the salt of the earth. We are the ones that preserve righteousness and blessing and light and liberty in the world, in the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, it's good for nothing but to be trampled underfoot by men. I think that what we're seeing in culture is a sign that the salt has lost its savor. We don't like to admit this often, but we can, we can measure by the outcome of Christianity in our generation and measure it with Christianity throughout history, and we can measure whether or not the salt has lost its flavor. Isn't that fair? We often don't like to take a look at that and, and sometimes that's the hardest thing to do is to take a look at things and ask, are we making the impact? And I don't mean us or Life Springs Church or it's we the church in this generation or we the church in this nation. Are we, make, are we being the salt that we have the potential to be? And it's not to make us feel bad or to make us feel way down. It's to make us feel excited and to feel hopeful that there is way more impact that we can make. That's what we need to realize. And, and it's that realization that we could be making a greater impact that, that gives us the courage to challenge the things that we love, the things that we are comfortable with, the things that we have known, and ask the Lord, God, give us a better way. Why? Because it, it really is a hard thing when we get together and we're around believers and we love the Lord and we are serving the Lord together and we enjoy his presence and we enjoy his word and we enjoy our times of prayer and we enjoy our devotions and we can just go down the list of all the things that we enjoy and it's right, it's good, it's not bad, it's not negative to, to many in the world. It's a glorious thing. But the question has to do with are we willing to measure our outcomes with the apostolic church or the church in the Reformation or the church under Whitefield, Wesley, and Edwards or the church in different times and seasons when they made the glorious impact on the world and turned the whole world upside down? Not to say, oh, we're doing a horrible job, but if we want to ha bear different fruit, we've got to change. And we're not saying the fruit is bad, the fruit is good. But if we want to bear better fruit, we've got to make a change. And that to me is hopeful that we can say, oh Lord, would you show us how to trade what is good for what is best? Lord, would you let us forget what lies behind and let us press forward for the upward call? Lord, I thank you for every blessing that you have brought forth in my life. I thank you for all the goodness that I have seen from your hand all the days of my life. But Lord, I pray that you would cause me to know you more, cause me to love others more, cause us to have a greater manifestation of your presence and of your Holy Spirit. You know, it's almost like, God, I would like to sit down with Samuel or, or Peter or John or Paul and say, I want to show me how to be like you were. Show me how to be like you were, because we want more. What we have is good, but there is more. And it's believing that can get us excited if you don't fall into the immature temptation of just feeling condemned and throwing in the towel or feeling judged. It's a call to more. It's like we want to be saltier Christians. Then it goes on. It says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. It's important to notice it doesn't say try to be the light of the world. It says you are the light of the world. You are the light nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. That imagery is so amazing. God says, I'm making you the light of the world, and I want to shine that light. I don't want it to be hidden. I want to take the veil off, and I want to show it to the world. You know, he wants to show it off. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. 
I just think it's amazing that this passage doesn't say your good character. It doesn't say your morals and your virtue. It says your good works. Oh, no, don't talk about works in the church. But it says, do we want men to see, or, or what does it say? Let me say it exactly. Do we want men to glorify our Father in heaven? Yes. How are men going to glorify our Father in heaven? They have to see our good works. Because it's what we do that demonstrates what we believe. It's what we do that demonstrates who we are. Without works, faith is dead. It's not real. The church has to just get over itself and dare to proclaim that. The world will glorify our Father in heaven when they see our good works. But I just couldn't help to ponder this whole idea. Instead of try to be the light of the world, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. So all you have to do to, get the, to break through the darkness of this darkened and evil world is to put a light bulb in it. Maybe the problem is we're just not getting out into the world enough. Ooh, that sounds dangerous. We need our holy bubble. Don't go out there where the darkness can overcome our lights. You know, I mean, I could tell you stories and you, yes, okay. Was I young in the Lord? Sure. But I remember a friend of mine came to the Lord and he had been, you know, did heroin and cocaine and marijuana and played in a heavy metal band and all this stuff and he calls me up and he gives his life to Christ, has a powerful encounter with the Lord. And, and then one day he's talking to me, he says, man, some of, my old friend, some of my old friends called me up and asked me to go to a Coke party. I was like, let's go. He's like, what? I go, yeah, there's unbelievers there. And so the two of, because I knew that I had no temptation and that I would be with him. And I had no, te and I, we all knew these people from high school. So we went. And the night before I went, I had a dream of a kid that I was friends with in middle school, really wasn't friends in high school. And I had a dream where he had fallen away, like I was on the path following Jesus. And I looked to the side and he had fallen by the wayside. And I went to him in this dream and brought him back onto the way. So we were there, we went to the party, they were doing their things that I mentioned downstairs, and we never went downstairs. There, you know, they had the house in the backyard, and there's people everywhere. And, you know, we're sharing, you know, talking, connecting, being light. But, you know, like, it, it's one thing to be there, but there's another thing when God actually acts. And so that kid that I saw in that dream, he shows up while we were kind of on our way out, and so we met him on the front door. He never even went inside. They had a little, you know, I don't know what you call them. They're not couches because they're for outside, and they kind of, but we were sitting on one of those outside couches in, on the front po um, porch, and we, he, we, he was just sharing his heart, and we were sharing our hearts, and um, he had been struggling over what had happened to him in his life, and we prayed for him to return to Jesus Christ that night. Being salt, bringing the light out into the world, not keeping it contained in the holy bubble. Would you know, like now in my position, and you know, like would you encourage any young person to do that? No, you know, but in those times, yes, I did those kind of things a lot, and God used it a lot, and it was it was kind of exciting. But so just this whole idea of be the light, or not be the light. You are the light. You are the light. So I was thinking about a story. What story could we read in Scripture that talks where you are the light of the world, whether you like it or not, and what happens when the light of the world goes out into the darkness, right? And it's really a funny story, and it's the story of Jonah. So Jonah commis was commissioned by God, but he doesn't like it, and he fled from the presence of the Lord. Well, he had to be in the presence of the Lord for him to hear God, right? Hey, Jonah, what's that? God, God is speaking to me. Yes, God is speaking to me. Woo! I want you to go to Nineveh and tell them that I'm going to bring judgment. Can't you just do it secretly so they don't know it's coming? Do you have to warn them? Because I'm just afraid. I know you, God. And if you warn them, they might repent and then you're not going to bust them up. Right? I know, I know who you are, God, so forget this. I'm running away. It actually says he was running from the presence of the Lord. 
but he's still the light of the world. He goes and he gets on a merchant ship and they get out into the water and such a great storm comes that the merchants throw the goods that they're going to try to sell off the ship. I mean, think about how desperate this is and how costly it is. This great storm comes and these men don't even care about anything at this point except saving their lives. And so they're willing to throw everything off the ship. And they go downstairs and they find Jonah sleeping. And they wake him up and they tell him to call on his God. Implying that they were so desperate they were not only throwing the goods off their ship, but they were probably play, praying to their gods, which were not, this, which were not, because were not, it's plural, the same God as Jonah's, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're being honest, right? So eventually they're trying to figure, and I love this because they actually had a more real worldview in a sense. Their real worldview is there must be a reason this is happening to us. And so they understood that prayer is necessary and they're trying to figure it out. They're trying to figure it out. It's not, it's not just a pure materialistic worldview. There is a reason this is happening. The world, something in the world is speaking. God. God is speaking through these circumstances. And so they cast lots to figure out who's responsible. And it falls on Jonah. And they ask him, who are you? And he defines him. If somebody asks you this question, who are you? Who are you? Is your first answer going to be, I fear the Lord? But Jonah defines himself with, I fear the Lord. Well, if you fear the Lord, why are you running from him, boy? You know, what are you doing if you fear the Lord, but you are running from him? But that's it. He is still the light of the world. He is still a man who primarily identifies with the fear of the Lord, even when he's running from the presence of God because he knows what God is up to. He's still the light of the world. And just in the sovereignty of God, he got himself out into the, into the unbelieving world. And the unbelievers are suffering pretty bad because Jonah's with them. But it's all going to work out. So Jonah 1, 10 through 16 says this. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. I mean, what a, what a great answer. Why would you flee from the presence of the Lord? Then they said to him, What shall we do that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And it's really interesting to me. His, I mean, listen to what Jonah says and what he's implying. I mean, you wonder what's going through this guy's mind. Well, the storm's going to kill us all anyway. I might as well die that they might live. Uh, right? Hmm. Sounds familiar, right? The high, he was high priest that year, and he prophesied that. And so they said, what, what can we do, you know, to calm the storm? And he said, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. And the men are like, they don't know what to do with this because I think obviously they probably know enough about God and that this is a man of God. And they're like, you want us to kill you? That doesn't seem right. We're stuck between a rock and a hard place. God could be angry at us for throwing you overboard to save our life. We don't know what to do, right? Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried to the Lord and said, We pray, O oh Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. They took vows. They offered a sacrifice. They feared the Lord. Here's Jonah in rebellion to God, fleeing the presence of the Lord, and a little light bulb goes out into the world of darkness. 
I mean, that's what happened. Then that light went over there, and because, you know, circumstances that happened to these unbelievers in the presence of the light of the world, they have an encounter that brings them to faith. Isn't that wild? So it's like, how do we turn the light on the world? We just have to get out into it, apparently. I mean, it's not that hard. And I mean, here, here's a guy who's, going, oh, yeah, I'm going out to be an evangelist. No, he was a prophet of the Lord. In other words, he was somebody who walked with God. He was somebody that feared the Lord. He was somebody who knew the presence of God. He was somebody who loved the Lord. He just didn't love the Ninevites. He didn't fully have the Lord's heart in his heart. But that's it. The characteristics of his life and the rhythm and values of his life were such that he walked with God. And so even when he was there having a family argument in a sense and he's running from the father, he's still a son of the father. And that, and that caused the light to go out where the light hadn't been before. It's very interesting, isn't it? So God's presence is what makes all of the difference. Jonah was fleeing the presence of God, but he really couldn't get away from it. He couldn't get away from God's presence. The only difference is that God's face was no longer smiling. He was now under discipline mode, correction mode. And that correction mode, just to give you some perspective, caused a whole storm at sea for one man. That's pretty wild. And the, all the other men were caught up in it. He was like a hot potato. I mean, he could have picked any merchant ship, right? But it's really interesting, isn't it? He still was a man who was part of his father's house in the presence of the Lord went with him. His face just changed its countenance, right? He was running from God. It's interesting, running from God creates storms. Running from God, and that doesn't just mean running from a calling. It doesn't just mean running from, go speak to Nineveh. But in every way of life, for all people everywhere, th there really is a principle there. When we um, run from his calling, his purpose, or design. Whenever we get away from the way God designed things to be, his purposes and his calling, it causes storms. It causes this world to rage. It causes people to suffer immensely. Although in Jonah's case, it was actually, it, there was a, sort of a weird situation going on that was a little different because his actual running from God actually was a testimony. Because what he was doing was he was testifying, I know God is a God who forgives. <laughs> Even his running from God, in a way, testified. I know who you are, God. You could, for, you could forgive them, and that's why I don't want to go. Right? But it really, you know, when I think about that whole picture, though, of we were talking about it on Wednesday night at our life group when we were reading about when Paul was on the ship with, with the men and ran into the Eurycliden, and, you know, the same exact thing happened. But this time it was different. Paul was not running from the presence of the Lord, but it was a whole different situation. What is it? The light of the world was headed toward, like, Rome was the epicenter of the most tyrannical, oppressive government this world has ever seen. And this light is on its way. Isn't that interesting? And the spiritual forces of darkness did not want that light to come. Isn't that wild? And, you know, there really is something that we need to understand. The way you can describe it is hot fronts and cold fronts mix and tornadoes happen. Right? It really is a clash of two kingdoms. This world is a clash of two kingdoms. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. And whenever they come into contact or conflict, storms happen. Right? So, you know, when the light of the world goes out into the world of darkness, storms are going to happen. So don't take that as a sign that we are not hearing and obeying the Lord. 
It's just a simple matter of fact that the more dangerous to the kingdom of darkness a move of God is, the more reasonable it is to expect tornadoes. Why? Because the hot front and cold front are mixing. So trouble does not always mean that we have forsaken or rebelled against God. Job is the most righteous man in the world. Devil went after him. Not because he had rebelled. But it's the same kind of principle, isn't it? So just so that we always get keep fully grounded in the word of God, that we understand that this world suffers greatly when we reject God's calling, purposes, and plans. When we reject his kingdom, when we reject his rule, great suffering happens. But, but oftentimes, there's this calm in the midst of the storm. And what I mean by that is the enemy will often allow things to degenerate without letting the, experience, the wages of sin being called in. Does that make sense? What I mean by that are, are it, it really is the prodigal son. The prodigal son. I mean, this is a story, same story throughout Scripture. They go out and, wow, it's so great to live and revel in the world and live in sin. You know, the, what they're really saying is the devil's house is better than my father's house. Right? Look how fun it is to revel in this sin. But then eventually that sin calls in its wages. And you find out what a mess your life has been made. How many people have suffered? How many people have been harmed? How, bro- how broken? It, it, it's, I said it promises heaven and delivers hell. That's what the world does. In all storms, whether the storm comes because we are r- running from the Lord, whether the storm is just the wages of sin being experienced in a life that is built in rebellion to God, or whether the storm comes because we are the light of the world and we're getting into the world of darkness, all storms are ultimately a reality because people have rebelled against Christ and his kingdom. There would be no clash of kingdoms if people hadn't rebelled in the first place. So it really does go back to wherever sin is embraced, wherever rebellion is re- embraced, wherever we are, live contrary to God's purpose, calling, and design, a storm is being set up. There's no way back. It's like, hey, you want to get off heroin? Yeah, guess what? You're going to have fun getting through the withdrawals unless God miraculously delivers you, right? I mean, really, a lot of, a lot of sin in people's lives, the journey back is painful, and a lot of people don't want to deal with the pain. It's like our culture in America. The reckless spending, reckless spending, increasing debt. As long as we can live high on the hog, let our children and our grandchildren figure it out. You, I mean, we are addicted to things that are broken and it will be painful to get back. But if we don't get back, what we are doing is we're saying we love our lives more than our children's lives. We love our lives more than anybody else. You, we, have to ha- we have to do the hard business of confronting where we have strayed from God's purpose, plan, and calling, and we need to come back. We need to return. So, but I am a little bit confused here. We are the light of the world? I thought Jesus was the light of the world. You know, I feel much more comfortable proclaiming Jesus is the light of the world. I don't really feel very comfortable proclaiming we are the light of the world. It just doesn't feel right, does it? But that's what God's word says, so it's true. We are the light of the world because we are the body of Christ. I I feel, you know, like I feel comfortable saying God is putting every enemy under the feet of Jesus but God is putting every enemy, every enemy under our feet. That's what it says. The God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. So there is really something really wonderful about this whole idea that we are the light of the world. It's that we are the body of Christ and that has incredible implications for light in the world. So if you're kind of getting the picture here, light in the, goes into the world of darkness, and now the darkness is illuminated. The darkness is broken. Uh, you know, like when you fly into a city at night, 
And you can, you can see all the lights, even as you're approaching, you can see all the lights of that city. How amazing how lights will light up the darkness, isn't it? And you fly over places at night and you can see what light does in a dark world. You know, like when the power goes out and you go driving at night and all the lights that you're used to are gone. And you're like, whoa, that light really does dispel the darkness, right? And we are the light of the world and the implication is that, that the gospel or discipleship is meant to fill the world with light bulbs. Or better yet, to light fires all over the world that causes light. The darkness is broken. It says they will have no need in the new Jerusalem. They'll have no need of the sun because the Lord will be the light. The, we are the light of the world. We have that same impact when we go. And when I say go, I, don't, I mean we go like, like we did there into a social context that was darkness. We brought the light. I can tell you story and story after story about that. But when we go into the different vocations and professions and be the light that God has called us to be, we bring that light. And the light destroys the darkness. It brings order and blessing and peace and righteousness and, and blesses the world. Isn't that awesome? But when we are afraid to go, then we leave the world in darkness. We need to be disciples, not believers. Does that, if does that sound a little wrong, it maybe it should rub a little the wrong way, right? Well, who are you? I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And so I just, I thought, but it's, there's a little truth here, too. We must be disciples, not believers, because the devil is also a believer. And it doesn't profit him. But I still don't like what you're saying. And I said exactly. Because language is all about intention and understanding. True believers are disciples. And true disciples are believers. Right? So a lot of times people say, I'm a believer. But that proclaiming to be a believer is an excuse to not be a disciple. But the reality is if we're not a disciple, then we're not truly a believer. And people really need to let that sink in. If we are not disciples, then neither are we believers. We are unbelievers. And if we are disciples, we are believers. Right? And that's why I say it's all about language and understanding what is the implication, what is the importance of what is trying to be communicated. Christ called us to be his disciples. His disciples believe in him. We go and we are called to make disciples, and disciples believe in him. It, it, it really is exciting. But there really has always been a battle, you know, when we talk about how do we have that impact in the world. It's these little ideas like this that make all the difference in the world. Because a lot of the church is creating believers that are not disciples. Because we focus so much on orthodoxy and right belief and what do you believe and are your beliefs correct? And we're not doing the works of the kingdom. We're not really following the Lord. We, he's not really our life. So it really is worth taking a little time to read some of the scriptures to talk about what is a disciple. Right? Let me just talk faster. Okay, Matthew 10, 37 through 39. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Man, Jesus, that's how you win the world. Talk like that. I mean, that is, that is a choker for people, isn't it? Especially like when in this world, the, the people that we often love the most are the ones he just mentions there. Right? And, aren't we, and, we are, and we are called in our covenant with God as disciples to love our family. So it's not, so he's obviously not meaning, well, you can't love your family. What is he really saying? You have to love Christ and be committed to him above everything else. And if anything else is above Christ, you are not worthy of me. If that's not true, we're not disciples. I mean, we got to really let that sink in, right? 
You could take anything in the world, the things that we love, the things that we care about, and you know what you care about by what you invest in. If you love any of these things more than me, you are not worthy of me. And if you're not willing to take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of me. But if you will lose your life, everything that you value, everything you care about, all your hopes and dreams, and die to them, everything that you are, die to it all, you will find life. You will find life. And you will find a life. See, this is the call of discipleship. It's believing in Jesus and being a disciple is not an addition to my life. It's a death to my old life and living in a whole new life. Until we get that right, Christianity and church is not something we add to our life. It's not an addition. It is our life. It is the sum total from which everything else falls underneath it. And everything else comes into place under it. And if that is not who we are, then we are not disciples. And if we're not disciples, we're not believers. Jesus had no problem challenging us. I, I, I mean, I can imagine people don't, would not like hearing talk like that in the church. But that's Jesus said it, not me. Right? Am I, am I misreading what he said? No. It's challenging, isn't it? But it's wonderfully challenging because it's also a call to us if we've, let, if we've lost our first love, if we've let other things of this world, if we've let cares and concerns or worries or fears, it doesn't matter what it is to dethrone Christ in our lives. He's calling us back. It's that simple. Come home. Return to me and I will return to you. We've got to be genuine disciples. That's what the world needs. And then we will be the light of the world. Who are the light of the world? See, I can't, you know, like in one sense, you, anybody who reads the, 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 the scripture, are they the light of the world? No, it's an intention. If you are my disciple, you are the light of the world. The devil believes all these truths. He's not the light of the world. Who is the light of the world? Disciples. What does a disciple look like? What defines it? It's what I just read. But then I like what, it, what you know, to understand it's a whole new life. And Peter, of course, being Peter, Peter said to him, this is Mark 10, 28 through 30, See, we have left all and followed you. And so Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. Jesus, did you have to throw that other one in there? Yeah. There's going to be a tornado. And in the age to come, eternal life. He doesn't just say you will receive eternal life. You will receive fathers and mothers and sisters and brothers. And Why? Because we become part of a new family. It's a whole new family created with his blood. Isn't that awesome? We only find it when we die to everything else in this world and we find a whole new world opens up to us, the family and household of God and eternal life. Oh yeah, and persecutions. There's your package, discipleship package, right? Fringe benefits. See, I think about a lot of the language that we hear and we, like we look at what's happening in culture and society and we know that there's a major breakdown of the family. And we know that if we can strengthen the family, it will be better for society, right? And a lot of times what we'll hear about is absentee fathers. Fathers not being fathers. I mean, today we could go much farther into that and we could look at divorce rates. We could look at so many different things that are destroying the family. And we understand that the, but we know that this is a problem because we understand the family is a community that is created by covenant and blood. Huh. 
And we get so, you know, when people are not being faithful to the covenant and it's falling apart, the children are being harmed. And the repercussions when they study what happens to the children of broken homes and all these different things, when, drunken, when there's drunkenness in the home, when there's drug abuse, when there's sexual abuse, the list goes on, broken homes, when fathers are not present. The statistics show how it impacts negatively the children, and it negatively impacts the society and the culture. And so you'll hear people going, we need to deal with the issue of absentee fathers. And the mar- marriage covenant is just one of our two great covenants in the baptismal covenant. And we hardly talk about absentee disciples. We, talk, we don't talk about AWOL disciples. Really, if we're absentee or AWOL from the family of God, we are prodigals. Think about it. Because there's so much wanting to live for ourselves and, and be independent and being our own God and being our own judge and, you know, everything in church is all about me. It's not about doing good work so that I glorify my Father in heaven. Does everything meet my, my expectations, my values, my will be done? Right? And unless we restore the family of God... Just like we, it's so easy to talk about restoring families. And everyone says, yeah, that's absolutely right. I get it. But when we start, start talking about restoring the family of God, ooh, you're crossing a line there, aren't you? It should be all about Jesus. This is all about Jesus. He instituted the church. He created the church. When we were baptized, we came into covenant responsibilities the same level as if we got married. And we can ask, do, are we, Lord, are we keeping our covenant? You know, that I mean, honestly, it's our covenant with Christ that will, will strengthen every other covenant, including the marriage covenant. God, we made a covenant by you, and I have to do right by you, God. And that means love, honor, cherish. I, I was thinking I'd like to add into the marriage covenant and, you know, to promise to be disciples of Jesus Christ all the days of our life. Why? Because that's the only thing that really makes it truly work. Because the families are breaking up left and right. Why? Because we do not value covenant relationships. We don't understand that that is the fabric of blessed culture and life and society of a blessed world. So we want to, we want to turn the light on the world. We need to be salt and light and we need to get the light out into the world. But we also need to restore the household and family of God. Ephesians. For we are members of his... Oh, yeah, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. If we're going to win the world, if we're going to win the world and have apostolic impact, we need to rebuild the church of Jesus Christ. Like I said, we can love what we have, love what we do, love the terms that, it is, that we have accepted, right? But, and we will keep bearing the same fruit that we've been bearing. But if we want to have that testimony, these people have turned the world upside down, we have to change. Changing with ideas like believers are disciples and disciples are believers. Changing with this realization that if I'm an absentee father, I'm unfaithful to the covenant of marriage and people are suffering. And if I'm absent from the household and family of God, because God has given me a calling and a gift to bring into God's house, he's given me a work to do to build up the body, that we are a greater light together. It's like if you've got an army going to war against a nation and everybody just goes out to fight it on their own, they're going to be absolutely destroyed if it's not a, a single operating body, right? All united for a common purpose and a common goal. And that's the same thing with the, we've got an army of darkness that is running rampant all over the earth. And it's time for the army of God to come together and knock it out, knock it out. Literally knock it out, turn the light on, overcome it, demolish it. We have that a possibility. And if it's not happening, then we have to seek the Lord. And just like they had to seek on that boat, 
Why is this storm happening, Jonah? God will reveal, we should be seeking God. God, show us how to be faithful to our baptismal covenant. God, teach us how to, be the, to bring the light to the world. God, teach us how to be a generation of believers that turn the world upside down. Because it really another part of discipleship is that we walk with God. We actually seek Him. We actually expect Him to answer prayer. We actually expect Him to communicate to us. That if we're seeking him, Lord God, teach us how to turn this world upside down. He's like, yeah, well, I'm not really in the mood right now. I'm binging Netflix. <laughs> God, you know, you know, like you think God is not going to answer that prayer. God, make me a vessel fit for your glory. Make me a vessel fit for your use. Unite us together. I pray, you, Jesus, you prayed that we would be one. Lord, bring unity to your body. Not the, the worldly secular unity, but I mean real unity under Christ. He is Lord of all as followers of, this, of Jesus Christ who have surrendered all and died to their life and live for him. I'll let you... We are the light of the world, and the light shines brightly. Now, I can't help it. I just, I think prophets like that, Jonah, Samuel, they're lights. I can't stop thinking about these prophets because they were lights in the world. They really were. And if you think about God's word calls us a prophetic people, a prophetic people. Well, the prophetic, the prophetic reveals the heart of God. It reveals the word of God. Uh, often, usually the prophets were revealing that you have uh, gotten away from God's design. You need to get back up. Time to kill the prophet. But the point is it brought God's voice into the earth. Does that make sense? It brought God's voice, but it often brought his presence. There were usually answers to prayer, signs and wonders and miracles around the prophets. I mean, Samuel prayed and God sent a storm in his prayer to show his heart. I'm telling you, this is the heart of God towards your attitude. I mean, that's pretty wild, isn't it? I mean, you, when you really look at the prophets, they did some of the coolest stuff. And we're called to be a prophetic people. That's exciting. All of the cool things that you read the prophets did, that is part of what it means to be a prophetic people. That's exciting. It should be exciting. A lot of times, well, that's not us. It can be. I mean, that's what Paul discovered. God worked unusual miracles, signs, wonders, miracles, went around tornadoes, hot front, cold front, light into darkness. It, it, man, it was like a bull in a china shop. He was awesome. The Lord was awesome through him, but it was awesome. So it's, it's God's communication to enlighten the world. We are prophetic people. Um, the gifts of the Spirit are really part of being a prophetic people, the spirit, gift of prophecy. It's not just word of knowledge. It's not just like the way we often make it to be. It, it really is the prophetic anointing comes, and what happens when that prophetic anointing comes, you know you're hearing from God. You're getting revelation from God. That's the biggest, you, you know, the biggest um, characteristic of the prophetic is you're receiving revelation from God. God is speaking to you, to your heart. 1 Corinthians, though, but I really, disciples obey. Disciples obey. So I'm going to give you a commandment to obey. It's a really horrible, mean, nasty, ugly commandment. 1 Corinthians 14.1. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. There's your commandment. Pursue love. Love must be the motivation. Love must be the reason. Otherwise, stop right there. You don't pursue, pursue your grandeur. Pursue your name. Pursue your reputation. Pursue looking good. Pursue trying not to feel bad. No, pursue love. And then desire spiritual gifts. But especially that you may prophesy. Pursue love. I want people to hear from God for themselves. Pursue love. I want people to know the goodness of God for themselves. Pursue love. I want to see the things of darkness and the things that are out of order broken in their lives. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts so that they can go free. Especially that you may prophesy. 1 Corinthians 14, 24 through 25 he says, if an, if an unbeliever and unprovoked, if, but if all prophesy 
if every one of us would speak the very oracles of God, speaking out of revelation, if an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that truly God is among you. I mean, that's what happened with Jonah. They had an encounter with God. They knew God was speaking in the storm. They knew when they spoke to the prophet that when the prophet gave them the word, this is all because of me, what should we do? Throw me overboard. They throw him overboard. That was God speaking. And they feared the Lord greatly and made sacrifice and made vows to the Lord. Pursue love. Desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. But I really think it's interesting. Come on, i got to do this in six minutes. So we're going to go really fast. How much more? Yes, we're going to go really fast. How do prophets work? Because, this, I mean, is this stuff exciting to you, being the light of the world? Really what we're wrestling with here is disciples save nations, how to be the salt and light that we're called to be, how to turn the light on in the world. And hope, hopefully you're getting ideas and things are, are stirring up in your spirit or things are being corrected or that God is working in many ways. But I love this whole realm of the prophetic what you know, like when we read about the prophets and we read about the cool things that they do and we read about their impact, and sometimes their impact is on the back end of you know speaking the word and it's disobeyed, and now there's consequences, and then they remember and come home. And we don't have time to talk about that. But what created that prophetic reality was a burden. They had a prophetic burden. What it was sim- because when I said pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, they cared so deeply for the glory of God, so deeply for his kingdom, for his government, for his ways, for the things that were on his heart, for justice, for righteousness, for truth. And they also cared tremendously for their people. They cared for their nation. They were burdened that their nation was wandering astray and what they did with that burden is instead of getting angry and complaining and causing trouble what they did is they took that burden to the Lord oh God why oh God what is your heart what is your word what is your voice what are you saying like the people there in the storm what is this storm speaking to us they were seeking an answer and they the prophets started with that burden for the glory of God and for their nation and their generation and they got the living word and they spoke that word and they knew that word was meant to bring repentance but it often except for places like Nineveh and Jonah it did the opposite But then what would happen is when they would see the rejection of God and his word trying to give them a last call. Their hearts would be broken even more. And they would start groaning and saying, oh God, is there any hope? Is there any hope when people's hearts are so hard? Is there any hope when people are so stiff-necked? And then God would open up their eyes. And like Isaiah is the perfect example He looked down the corridors of history and he saw Jesus born in Bethlehem, suffering and dying on a cross, saw him resurrected, saw the covenant of redemption, saw him ascended and saw the messianic kingdom come because he was crying out, is there hope? And he was looking to see what the apostles say has come in our day. Isn't that awesome? But that's how you stir up that prophetic. It's a burden for the glory of God and his ways and the truth and a burden for the people that wants to have the word and heart of God for the people and wants to have and wants to have hope for the people. Hope for the future. Isn't that awesome? It's awesome. I was going to read some of the passages of Isaiah, but I'm going to skip it now. Because I, I read, but I do want you to understand Isaiah. Isaiah, when he was 
under Uzziah and Jotham, they, they experienced nas- the nation, wa- you know, the kings and the leaders were walked in the ways of God, and he knew the blessings of walking in the ways of God under those leaders, even though there was still sin among the people, right? But then when Ahaz came, it was total corruption. He walked against the way of the Lord. Isaiah, in the year, when Uzziah died, that's when he had his vision. Because he saw with the passing of Uzziah, is there going to be another godly king take the throne? Where is the nation headed? I can still see the sin in the people. And he had that burden, and with that burden, he was caught up to heaven, and he got the call of God. I mean, that's so moving, isn't it? And then what happened is that came to him just in time, because Ahaz came to the throne, and he was evil and corrupt and wicked. And God used Isaiah to, work, to bring a national revival through Hezekiah. Do you see the beauty of it? When they have that prophetic anointing, that prophetic people, he had that burden, he had that calling, and, and, and he was able to weather the days of Ahaz and work in the days of Hezekiah and bring a national level revival. But he could also see where it was headed at. towards the end of Hezekiah's life. He could see where the nation was headed again. Because it's like, people, don't you get it? God has spoken. When we fear the Lord, the blessing and the rejoicing, and then when you turn away and revel in sin, the destruction, and I can see the trajectory. And that's why he got some of the greatest revelations of Christ and his kingdom. Because he was so broke in heaven, seeing blessing and darkness and blessing and darkness. Oh, when will this ever end? There's a man coming whose name is Jesus. And he will be we're going to celebrate it soon, born in a manger, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He rose from the grave, and he ascended into heaven, and he sat down on the throne, and he rules and reigns. He is the Lord. He is the Lord. He is the hope of the nations. Wherever Christ is proclaimed, idols are demolished, people are set free, strongholds are broken. People turn their swords into plowshares and lift up their hands in prayers. I see that there is power in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to heal the nations. And we've seen it in history. We have seen it in history. That disciples save nations because we are the light of the world. But let, may the Lord just move on us and stir on us to give us such a hunger and a passion for more, to get us past what we're comfortable with and what we're used to, to give us that prophetic burden. I don't want to just prophesy. I want that prophetic burden. I want to love with that love that Christ loved. I want that heart that was in the Father that so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. I want that love that will stir and will st- and move and awaken in us the presence and glory of God to go and to break through the darkness of this world and to liberate captives. We've got to get that heart so burning in our souls that it would motivate us 24-7, 365 days a year. Lord, I don't, you know, like the word to the church, you've tested those who say there were apostles and we're not, and you've done all these things right, but I've got this one thing against you. You've lost your first love. One could say a disciple walks in that first love. How can we not if we just take a look at that man on the cross? How can we not when we remember his mercy and his grace and his love, and when we see our Father's heart, we want that heart to be communicated to this world We want his redemption to be communicated to this world, but Lord, let it burn in me. Revive it in me, Lord God, so that we can take it out into the world. Disciples save nations. Turn on the light. Be the salt and the light. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together.
Our prayer this morning, Lord, is that you would indeed revive a right spirit within us. Revive that heart, Lord, that has your burden, your love, your compassion. Lord, the things that motivate you. No, the things that motivated you from the very beginning of the fall in the garden. Lord, when, the, when it looked like humanity was lost, you said right then and there, I covenant with you that there will be a seed and he will, he will come and he will redeem what has been lost. Lord, I pray. I really meant what I said a while ago, Lord, that this season would remind us of all the effort that you went to and went through to restore a world gone wild. Lord, I pray that we will get your heart and your mind and that we will be not driven but compelled with love. Compelled by love to forfeit our own wills, compelled by love to give and give and give. And when changes come, to keep on loving still, compelled by love, to love and live for you, Lord. And to become, no, just to go ahead and be that light in a dark place, wherever you have planted us. I pray this in the name of Jesus for every single one of us standing here before you right now, Lord. Amen and amen. You agree with that? Amen. Let's do it. Let's be it. The light in a dark place. For we have an anointing. That anointing that was upon Jesus. That same anointing can break captives free. It can break strongholds. It can bring that hope. Amen? Amen. Let's do it. If you need prayer specifically, we'll be here. If you want to pray in general, just come on up here. Let's pray. And let's seal this message in our hearts this morning. Amen.